Now, Israeli forces have largely withdrawn from southern Gaza. The move comes six months after the Hamas attacks on October the 7th, marked yesterday, as Israel and Hamas have both sent delegations to Cairo to join fresh ceasefire negotiations. This as we have continuing pressure on the UK government to stop sending arms to Israel uh, under legal treaties. Well, joining me right now to discuss this is Barrister with UK Lawyers for Israel, Natasha Halstoff. Uh, good morning to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, also still with us, of, of course, uh, is Sam Armstrong, who's joining us for the whole show. Um, Natasha, um, just want to ask you, first of all, in terms of what is happening in terms of withdrawal of forces and negotiations, does this suggest, and we know more aid is now going into Gaza, still not enough, does this present a, an easier backdrop for the British government in terms of its legal position, in terms of sending arms to Israel, if there are more negotiations, if more aid is going in, and if we don't have an imminent threat of a strike against Rafa by IDF forces. Does that ease the position for the British government or does that have no bearing on it legally? I don't think the position has changed at all. And in fact, that letter, uh, which has been referenced, sent to the Prime Minister last week, was responded to pretty swiftly uh, by a letter calling out the inaccuracies in it, the, the errors... Can I clarify, this was a letter that was sent, I said, three former Supreme Court judges, um, other 600 legal minds, the great and the good, basically saying we should suspend sales to, of arms to Israel because uh, under our legal treaties, legal obligations, you know, we could be in breach of those and urging the, the government to suspend those sales. This new letter has actually far more signatures and a similar level of the great and the good. Supreme Court justices, Court of Appeal justices, former chairman of the bar. Uh, we've also had a former director of public prosecutions, Lord MacDonald, um, min, min, former justice ministers. So, yes, and far more signatures. Yesterday, I think it had uh, already surpassed 1,200. And what are they saying? Why are they saying it's fine for us to carry on sending arms to Israel? Well, the first important um, purpose of the letter was to point out the serious error that the first letter fell into in terms of misstating what it was the International Court of Justice uh, had determined in January of this year when it made that provisional order at the request of South Africa. But there were other errors in that original letter, uh, for example, claiming that the Security Council resolution uh, that was recently passed calling for an immediate ceasefire was in any way legally binding. It's unfortunately, a, 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 in reality, it's a political resolution, yeah. not a legally binding one. And there was a, a reliance, unfortunately, on Hamas propaganda casualty figures in that initial letter also. So I don't think it's surprising that it's been called out so robustly um, in the first instance by the preeminent legal journalist Joshua Rosenberg, but very quickly uh, that same day subsequently by, as I say, over 1,200 lawyers, barristers D Does um, any of this judges. really matter, given that in terms of the arms that Israel has, less than 0.1% are actually provided by the UK, the vast majority uh, either made in Israel, provided by America, actually an awful lot come from Germany. Um, but does any of it really matter? Is this actually just sort of a sort of a dinner party principle virtue signal by uh, a number of lawyers who wrote the initial letter um, and politicians, that, you know, showing to the electorate who are concerned about civilian deaths, oh, it's not us. Is this, is this just... Is this just virtue signalling and about principles? Or does it actually have a practical implication for Israel or, and for Britain? Well, two aspects to that. First, I would say this is the opposite of virtue signalling. If in its hour of need, the UK is prepared to abandon its ally Israel, when Israel is essentially fighting our war for us against uh, these Islamist fundamentalist terror organisations. But more importantly than that, it does have a practical impact because it serves to encourage Hamas. These misstatements about international law and misstatements about the factual legal uh, and position on the ground um, serve, unfortunately, to encourage Hamas to prolong the conflict. They've walked away from those negotiations. Uh, the ceasefire proposal that was backed by the Americans, we've forgotten, it seems, entirely about the hostages, 133 of them uh, that we know still and hope still to be alive in Gaza. Uh, and the debate including the letter that we saw from the civil servants, which you referenced earlier, is being substantially influenced by this kind of... Well, no, the civil, these are civil servants within the government who are saying that they, they, they feel that they would have to go on strike and couldn't work if they were... Uh, if, if they disapprove of government policy, if breaking the law, if they believe that, you know, sending arms to Israel... I mean, absolute abject nonsense. Just do, do shut up. You don't make policy. You're a civil servant. That's literally the point of your job. But based on the misinformation which has now been called out by some of the most senior lawyers, former judges, solicitors, barristers in the country. There it does seem, and we discussed this before on the show with you, this, this complete mismatch of the public understanding of 
international law regarding warfare and, uh, and, and the actual reality. Because, look, any, any reasonable person would be horrified by the deaths of any civilian, particularly children in Gaza. Anyone who's not horrified by that, he, he frankly, is a monster. And also horrified by, yes, it doesn't matter more because they are British, but of course we feel more affinity. Three Brits who are working as aid workers among the seven who were killed in their aid convoy that were killed uh, more than a week ago uh, in, in Israel. Now, you know, the IDF admitted very soon afterwards, they did an investigation, it was them, it was a mistake, they've apologised. That doesn't make it OK for the families, friends and colleagues of those people. They've still lost their lives. Um, but um, we're told, you know, this is a war crime. This, this means that we must stop supporting Israel. They are brutal monsters. They've, they've, they've done this horrible crime. Um, under, under international treaties, under international uh, understandings of law in terms of warfare, these things are accepted, tragically, as things that happen, aren't they? Well, it is a big tragedy that friendly fire incidents are a significant percentage of casualties in any conflict. Israel has had friendly uh, soldiers um, from the IDF killed in friendly fire. There was the incident of the three hostages who were also uh, shot in this tragic incident uh, with the World Central Kitchen workers. What international law is based on is not an effects-based analysis, but an intention-based analysis. And Israel has been consistently clear about not just the way it upholds international law, but about the way that it goes far above the requirements of international law. And only yesterday, I interviewed John Spencer, who is an American. He teaches urban armed conflict. He's the head of urban armed conflict at West Point uh, in the United States. And he's been on the ground in Gaza and has consistently said, as a result of what he's seen, that Israel has gone further than any other army in the history of warfare, in the context where Hamas, of course, is seeking to use its breaches of international humanitarian law to its advantage, Israel has gone further. By, yeah, and by using... Uh, civilians as human, human shields, shields. Uh, using hospitals, schools, um, clinics, ambulances. We know from testimony from the hostages that were uh, successfully released that um, Hamas had been transporting them in ambulances. And so John Spencer and others, Colonel Richard Kemp, have been very clear having been on the ground there, about the standards that Israel is adhering to. And all of this, of course, is being um, misrepresented mm. by those... I've spoken to a number now of the signatories of that original letter who have essentially said that they've based their assessment on what they've seen on television. Well, isn't that an indictment of how the media, uh, broadly speaking, well, has been, been covering... If they've been watching this show, well, then, they, they, then, they, then they might have actually had a more sensible view of it all. And, I mean, let's come to you, Sam Armstrong. It, 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 look, we've talked about this again and again in the last six months, but it, it does still amaze me, the number of people who are absolutely outraged by the death of civilians and, and the, the conduct of war when it's Israel, but never seem to have any issue at all with, you know, Assad murdering en masse, on a huge scale, his own civilians, remarkably unbothered about Saudi Arabia and, and people in Yemen, remarkably unbothered about, you know, um, what China is doing uh, to the region people. I mean, it, it, it is extraordinary how selective people are um, with with the, the, the countries and the victims that they choose to care about. There are people that are sitting and waiting, ready for Israel to make the slightest slip up in order to pounce on it. We saw it earlier in the conflict where it was suggested that Israel had bombed a hospital. It turned out it was, in fact, Palestinian Hamas terrorists. Uh, the, they are gleeful. They are rubbing their hands with delight at any chance to pile on to the only Jewish nation on earth. Now, there are an awful lot of commentators, some on the left of politics, British politics, that say that it has nothing... That there's, it's just a sheer coincidence that the only Jewish country on earth is the one country they single out for particular scrutiny, particular criticism yeah. that goes far beyond that of any other country. I don't believe it. No. I have reached the point now where I think Israel is being held to not just a higher standard, but a standard that simply doesn't exist in any other yeah. armed conflict in the and, history and, of war. And certainly not a standard we we require of our own uh, military, certainly. Um, can I also ask you, uh, uh, Natasha, about this extraordinary survey carried out by the Henry Jackson Society? They asked, um, they polled Muslims, they also polled a wider, you know, selection of the, of the, the general public um, to see what the general view in this country is of things like um, Hamas uh, and events on October the 7th, but also what British Muslims thought. The, sh the results are shocking. I mean, 
Well, although interesting, as the as the uh, Faisal Mughal, who founded the Interfaith Groups, tell Mama Faith Matters and Muslims Against Antisemitism, he said the findings are shocking, but also not shocking. Only one in four British Muslims, according to this survey, believe that Hamas did commit murder and rape in Israel on October the 7th, despite all the evidence that's been presented. Um, they also found in this poll that 46% of British Muslims, so almost half of British Muslims, said they sympathise with Hamas, a prescribed terrorist group that has boasted openly about the atrocities they committed on October the 7th, has said they will repeat that on every occasion when they can, and whose entire, their constitution confirms they, they want the annihilation, not just of Israel, but the killing of every Jewish person. Not just in Israel, but in the entire world. The fact that there are people living in this country, many will be British born and bred, same as me, who believe that a terrorist organization is someone they should sympathize with, and that what has been reported in the news in the last six months is completely made up. What, is, what, is, what do you make of that? Well, I looked at some of the raw data of that polling, um, and that included the question as to whether or not uh, the respondents thought that Israel was committing genocide against the Palestinians. 80% yeah. yeah. of the Muslims polled believed that to be correct. Um, and amongst the wider population, it was 46%. Yeah. And the really, really concerning aspect when you look at the breakdown of the figures is that amongst the population uh, that has been to university... Yeah, it's higher. It's higher. Yes. And it did actually, in terms of um, whether or not Hamas committed murder and rape on October the 7th, um, uh, roughly a third of, of the wider population don't, don't believe it happened. What on earth is going on? Is this people, is this people sort of reading their own sort of echo chamber of, of social media? Um, what, what, how on earth can people think that? Well, certainly in terms of the way that the legal issues have been presented, and genocide is uh, first and foremost in terms of the legal accusations that Israel mm. um, is, uh, is facing. Well, people, I mean, people just need to get a dictionary to look up the word. Uh, or indeed uh, read the letter uh, that has yeah. been sent in response, uh, which um, addresses the International Court of Justice proceedings on this. Uh, and of course, any time this issue is being addressed, the, the critical aspect of that definition of, of genocide is intention. Um, and it doesn't have any application here. It is a blood libel that is being advanced. And because it is... These are anti-Semitic so, tropes, basically. Well, absolutely. And when we think about, you know, the original blood libels, the anti-Semitic tropes in the Middle Ages, they were perhaps as widely believed as this polling now indicates that these falsehoods uh, are being... Uh, terrifying accepted. is the word I would use. Terrifying. We have a very, very big problem. And I think it's a very big problem across the whole of Western society. I mean, it's a damn sight bigger in the Middle East. Uh, but we have a problem. We have, we've, Im we've imported it here. I'm sorry we have. Um, Natasha, really appreciate you joining us. Uh, Natasha Hausdorff, she's a barrister uh, for, with UK Lawyers for Israel.